Hello, I'm Ben McKechn, host of the Lord's Prayer podcast with theologian David Honey. We are going to take a closer look at the world's most famous prayer to enrich our own conversations with God through the prayer Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In every episode, we will explore a different line, clause, petition, request of the Lord's Prayer, always with the aims of glorifying God and firing up our own prayer lives. David Honey is a lecturer in Christian thought at Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia. He also wrote The Last Things, a detailed book about how the Lord's Prayer is a lens for understanding God's purposes for us in Jesus now and into eternity. This is episode eight. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the end, my friends, the end of our podcast voyage into the Lord's Prayer. Now, let's take a final sweep of the world's most famous prayer to further cement it deep within. David, great to be with you again for one last time. Yes, this is the last hurrah. Thank you, everybody. You've been very patient to get this far. <laughs> and you've been very patient with a lot of my questions, which are very repetitive, David. So in advance of asking you another repetitive question, I thank you very much again for your patience. <laughs> and my repetitive question being always at this time, David, is where are we up to in the Lord's Prayer? Well, today we've got uh, an issue to talk about, which might catch people's attention when they are used to saying the Lord's Prayer in church, but then go to read Matthew or Luke and notice that there's what feels like a pretty significant part is missing. And that is the kind of ending that we use in church. Uh, yours be the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The kingdom, yeah. the or power yours and the is glory. the kingdom, the power yours and the glory. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And in a lot of versions in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, I don't even think Jesus says amen at the end of his own Lord's Prayer, as we now call it. But he doesn't even say amen. But sorry, sorry, that, that being as it, as it may, you're right. It is very strange to go back to God's word and then discover at least some versions don't have yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Which is such a great final line. And yet what's going on, David? Why, why isn't it included in some? Well, at a slightly nerdy level, uh, if you've got uh, a Bible that has footnotes in it, you'll see that uh, it has one of those sort of footnotes that says some manuscripts contain, which means that's not spooky or a conspiracy theory or anything like that. It probably just means that as the Bible was being copied and distributed throughout the world over time, uh, some, a few maybe a whole group of particularly pious scholars thought that uh, we should add these words to finish it off. Now, if that happens a few times, people start to think, oh, oh well, this is how it, it's always been like this. Uh, and so the, a tradition might arise. How are you going at the moment with this early and broad discussion of Bible translations and additions, possible additions to Scripture? As we also showed in the last episode, David's not able in these conversations to delve deeply into the fullest explanations of variations among biblical manuscripts or translations or what this means for our trust in the versions of God's Word, which we have now. Although in about 10 minutes, I do raise again this issue of manuscript differences and trust after David has taken us on an excellent excursion into God's power, 
it was so good, I didn't want to interrupt it. So as we head towards that, and before we come back to this important subject of translations, manuscripts, scriptural editions, let me recommend to you, if you haven't done this already, to seek more information and details about how the Bible has been passed down across the centuries, the arguments for its veracity and the best ways we can handle such occurrences as the finale to the Lord's Prayer, a finale that David swiftly starts to sum up next as a possible popular coda for corporate gatherings. And certainly... It's the kind of addition that is very helpful to people in church because really up until the 15th, 16th century, ordinary Christians didn't have access to their own Bible by any means. Bibles really only existed in a church. Uh, If the church could afford one, it had its own Bible that was often um, chained to the uh, lectern on which it was so that nobody would nick it. But people learnt the Lord's Prayer by reciting it. Uh, No doubt it was deemed at some point to be fitting to finish off the prayer, almost like going back to the beginning again. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. That's not a long way away from what we prayed for God in the beginning, that his name would be treated as hallowed, that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done. Now, when we looked at those three petitions, particularly as they are fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, uh, the images of glory were right there to hallow God's name through all the earth is when it's confessed to belong to Jesus, the Christ. Uh, And so Paul writes in uh, the second chapter of Philippians that uh, amazing hymn about the Lord Jesus, which finishes with a vision of every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the hallowing of God's name and his glory is right there together. The kingdom of uh, the Lord Jesus coming, the kingdom that God will perfect through the Lord Jesus is always his kingdom, but he has chosen to rule the earth, to rule the universe through his son, the son of David, who's the resurrected Messiah forever and ever. Amen. And the last one, perhaps the one that we might want to talk about uh, or tease out a little bit is the question of power. Mm, I don't know if we've really talked about power in any of our conversations thus far. I'm sure it's come up in some way, shape or form talking about the Lord Jesus and just talking about God, the Father Almighty. But I don't particularly remember us diving into power. Power itself hasn't necessarily arisen, even though it's almost flowing through the whole prayer again, given who we are actually talking about and who we are praying to. Yeah, and I think that's deliberate because in many ways the prayer, it's been teaching us a whole lot of theology all the way through and it's been teaching us all uh, about the significance of other parts of the Bible and really this prayer helps us to thread various parts of the Bible together even as those parts of the Bible expand on uh, the various petitions. And so we need to be taught as sinners the truth about power, that God uses his power to save. But when God uses his power to save, it's not like worldly power. So think of the way that Paul speaks to uh, the Corinthians, a church living in a powerful Christians, living in a powerful city. And so Paul talks to them about the wisdom of God and the power of God being revealed most importantly at the cross. And the kingdom of God is when the Lord Jesus is crowned with thorns on on a cross, executed as uh, an insurrectionist. Which Paul describes as in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or 2, describes that sort of power as foolishness to right. the world, in the world's eyes. That's right. What is more right is to say 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 18 through to 25. The question of the exercise of divine power for salvation is always almost the opposite of what the world expects. The world expects spectacular shows of power, invariably military, emperors, 
rule and all that kind of coercive domination, aggression, and the natural response to that is envy because really everybody would like a go at being the emperor and yet that's the profundity, the the profound distinction of what both true love looks like but the actual exercise of power Firstly, it's exercised in love by God for salvation of his enemies. But it's also exercised in a way which is, despite the circumstances, never really threatened. The Lord Jesus goes about his ministry. People oppose him all the time. And yet he's undaunted. Unwavering. Unwavering. Mm. And... Actually heads towards what he know is, knows is going to come. That's right. From the earthly powers who yeah. think that they're somehow able to thwart, stop him. Yeah. Uh, such is God's power, especially in the face of our envy, because really one of the main energy sources for our sin is envy of God's sovereignty over us. We're envious of his authority deeply in our hearts and we 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 share that with others really in terms of what leads us to sin against them but especially towards god such is the power of god's true king his messiah is that he's able to give himself up to our envy to show us how powerless it really is and so you get this incredible reversal going on at the cross that the one who seems totally powerless is in fact the ruler of the universe and the ones who feel the most powerful are actually defeated in their act of putting him to death. So the true nature of power, especially in relationship to love, is something that the New Testament writers have to come back to again and again and again and again. So it seems to me only appropriate that we would finish off this majestic prayer that we've been praying to our heavenly father asking him to make his heavenly fatherhood what it is on the earth through the lord jesus kingdom glory and power are the things that we need to give back to god in submitting to him in this prayer before i ask you a little bit more about that i'm still thinking about the addition of this line Mm -hmm. in different versions, translations of the Bible, should I be concerned? You mentioned something before about some very pious scribes um, at some point wanting to inject this line and possibly for corporate worship so people together could say this. Should I be concerned that people are injecting stuff into God's word all over the place? And so therefore would that undermine the authority of the Bible in the form that I have now? Should I be questioning virtually every sentence in the Bible? How can I trust that this is what was originally written down by the original authors? And in this case alone, in the Lord's Prayer, how do I know that what is in most Bibles is what Jesus had to say? And then this final line, someone seems like they've whacked it in later. Well, I think the very fact that uh, modern translators have shown that it's an addition gives us confidence. It's only if it's when those sort of things are not acknowledged that we would have reason to be uh, to lack confidence. Like they've combed through so many manuscripts and verified that, well, the bulk of the Lord's Prayer as we know it, that's consistent. The bit that isn't consistent is this line at the end. Yeah, and so the actually what the translators, the translators have done us a service by saying you may be able to find somewhere... Uh, a manuscript of Matthew's or Luke's gospel that will have these lines in it, but it's very rare uh, and it's not in the majority of them. So that's really a sign of the translators doing us a service which should in fact give us more confidence in what we're reading, not take it away. That's a helpful overall approach to having confidence in Bible translations. As we mentioned earlier though, You should investigate for yourself what David or I or anyone else suggests about the veracity of Bible translations. We hope doing that will be a helpful, empowering research project for your faith. And you were mentioning before about 
giving back to God his kingdom, power, and glory, this final line of the, the Lord's Prayer that we're talking about. So it's more of a reminder to us that it's not ours as opposed to reminding God that it's his. That's right. Because he wouldn't have forgotten, I'm imagining, that it's Probably his not. kingdom, no, power, and glory. that's not his mind. Yeah, no. we, we often try not to be in the mind of God and Jesus too much here, David, but I'm, I think I'm safe in my presumption that that's the case. Yes, that's right. Calvin uh, commented uh, particularly actually about the last petition where we're uh, asking God to save us from the time of trial and deliver us from the evil one. Calvin was very careful to say, now, don't." Th- the reason this is written is so that we don't fall into some kind of hubris that because we have Jesus, because we have Jesus, we're act- we can take on the devil at any time. You know, now that I'm a Christian, now that I believe the gospel, I even have the Holy Spirit, look out, evil, here I come, uh, I'm going to triumph. Uh, not so much, says Calvin. This petition is there because it's a reminder to us that we are always reliant upon God and only God to deliver us from evil. And so when we finish off this prayer by saying to our Heavenly Father, yours is the power, the glory and the kingdom, yours is the rule over evil, over forgiveness, over provision for our lives. That's really just reminding ourselves how great our Heavenly Father is, whose name we want hallowed, whose kingdom we want to come and whose will we want to be done. And I was just thinking about it having forever and ever at the end or forever, amen, but forever at least being among the final words in this line And do you think that's people trying to remind us of some of the things that you've been discussing throughout these conversations, which we might not catch as we we recite this or we read this quickly, which is this is a prayer not just for our every day, which it is, but we're also praying about the now and not yet, the tension of living in this world where Jesus is king, but he's ultimately coming back and will be crowned as forever king which he is, but his kingdom will fully come. God's kingdom will fully come through Christ. So this word forever in the last line, I'm just thinking about it now. Again, I don't think I'd really stop to pay attention to how it's pointing me towards this is not just a prayer for my everyday life, but it is a prayer that I'm praying forever. Yeah, that's right. It's another reason of why it could be fitting to add this at the end, that we prayed that God's heavenly fatherhood would be revealed to be on the earth what it is in heaven forever. That is, make it like this on earth forever and ever in the same way that it's like that in heaven forever and ever. So it's really just tying up the timing, as you pointed out, that we can pray these things because they're already true in the Lord Jesus but they haven't been perfected yet. So we want God to perfect what he has achieved in Jesus and have that last forever because that's the way we want the world to be and that we know that's what the Lord Jesus deserves. I'm hoping that by this stage of the Lord's Prayer podcast, you are enjoying the steady reminder of praying the Lord's Prayer and wanting what we pray to be so now and forever loving the truth of these things as confirmed in the Lord Jesus and assured of their upcoming perfection. Amen, right? As we tie up our conversations, David, the eighth of our season of discussing the Lord's Prayer, focusing on this last line, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, Whether it's been inserted later or not, it is a pretty nice um, uh, wrapping up of this prayer. As we wrap up and as we've done in other conversations talking about how this affects me and you and everybody in their prayer life, how do you think this final line can help effectively summarize what's come before it in the Lord's Prayer and shape our thinking and our hearts and our minds in our prayer lives on a daily basis if I go away and pray now? How is this last line going to help me particularly distill some of the things we've, we've discussed in previous conversations? What do I want for my life? That's something we ask ourselves all the time. That's big. And if you're uh, a wealthy, relatively wealthy Christian living in a peaceful country like I do, you do too, 
we feel like we have a pretty wide variety of choices available to us and the means to bring those choices to reality. And so I I can very easily get into the habit of asking myself what would I like for my life and then making a plan for how I'm going to make my life the way I would like to have it. But this prayer finishes in a very different way. It finishes by reminding me that what I need for my life is for Jesus to be king, for him to be powerful in my life and for him to be glorious in my life. And that for not me or not you. No, no, I'm, you know, I can think of a dozen different ways in which I'd like to be powerful uh, and certainly glorious as a result. You know, I can, I can live without being a king. He can, good, good. <laughs> I've noticed that about you, David. <laughs> <laughs> but these, this way of finishing the prayer reminds me of who I really am and what I really need that my life needs to have Jesus as the king and the power that I feel that I need in my life is the power of his spirit uh, that saves me, that turns my heart back towards him as my saviour and God as my father. And the kind of glory that I really need for my life is that when people recognise me as belonging to Jesus, that's actually when I am glorious, when people see the Lord Jesus or somehow my life reminds them of the Lord Jesus. That's glory for me because it's God's glory. And if I understand who I am really, then I want God's glory to be in the world forever and ever. Do you also think that slowing down and really reflecting deeply on all the elements of the Lord's Prayer and then ending up at your kingdom come, sorry, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Whether people live in a country and in a status, for want of a better word, as we do, social status, or they live in a country vastly, vastly different to ours, it still should point all of us back to prayer because it reminds us that it's not about our own kingdom, glory, and power. And to help us to be reminded of that, uh, to help us to know that, to help us live that out, we need to pray. As Jesus, and we, as we talked about in the first conversation, Jesus says, um, and pray like this. He didn't say pray like this every now and again. The, the, the suggestion doesn't seem to be just do it whenever you feel like it, whenever you get desperate or whatever. This is a lifestyle choice. And as we've discussed throughout the Lord's Prayer, and many times I've been struck by some of your insights into the prayer, all of which keep pointing back to, as you were just describing then, this difference between it being about God, about Jesus, and everything coming together in them, not about me. So I take it that this last line in the prayer, just like all the other petitions that we've discussed previously, is at very least a driver back to prayer so I can be reminded that it is about God and Jesus and all of their glory, not about my own. Exactly. The most effective way that I will be saved from the time of trial and delivered from evil is to remember who I am and who God is and how God is for me, for us, in the Lord Jesus, that I live as a child of God by the grace of the Lord Jesus and in the power of his spirit because all things belong to God and having him glorified as our heavenly father is what's true about the universe. Mm -mm. And one of the ways we get to do that is through prayer, Yeah, which I, I think often we can just forget or overlook or it seems too simple but not really. No, no. That, it's, it's how the mystery of the universe is revealed in the church, as Paul tells the uh, Ephesians, that when Christians in their sort of basically chaotic lives can call out to the creator of the universe as their heavenly father. That is the great mystery of God at work in the world, in the prayers of ordinary people, saying true things about God, about themselves and about the world. As we head towards the grand finale, David, we're at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we're at the end of the Lord's Prayer podcast. 
thank you so much for all the time we've got to hang out. These conversations have been fantastic. Your wisdom and insights through the Last Things book, but also through your conversations with us over the last, what is it, seven episodes We're now on the eighth. Been fantastic personally for me and I hope for other people too. Oh, for me too. Thank you. It's been a joy to oh. uh, chat about this with you. How much fun is it to go into the Lord's Prayer? Great. Like who knew that you could get so much out of it? I think you did, David, and many other people have before, but we hope that um, everybody is able to grasp something from this prayer, even renew their love for it Mm. and their Mm. desire to pray it. So thank you, David, for spending so much time with us on the Lord's Prayer podcast. To finish up, if I walk away with one thing, just one thing from the Lord's Prayer podcast, what do you hope that is for me and for everybody else? Well, that the creator of the universe, the God, is our Father. And he loves us and his love is stronger than death. And his power he uses through Jesus and in in his spirit to make us right with him. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, Heavenly Father, in Jesus. And my life, your life, our lives can be a reminder of that, a witness to that, a celebration of that. Thank you so much for joining us on the Lord's Prayer podcast. And we hope it has been a blessing to your connection with God and Jesus as we've explored, examined and enjoyed the wide-reaching facets of the world's most famous prayer. A prayer that we can pray with frequency, passion and intent. I'm Ben McKechn. We are so thankful, aren't we, to theologian David Honey for his wisdom and insights. And thanks to Jesus for leaving us with a prayer to shape our very existence. Keep praying. Our Father in heaven, your name be honoured as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.